Georgie's story is every parent's nightmare. The teenagers in a mental health battle made worse by the pandemic and lockdowns. And Georgie's not alone. Her mum and dad say their daughter needs more care and support, but she's stuck in a system that's overwhelmed. There were a number of places you could jump off into this waterhole. Happy days on holiday in Hawaii. Come on, let's do it. Georgie was the only one who jumped off at 30 feet. I had a look and said, no way. She's out there and she can challenge herself and she's got an enormous amount of talent. This is the Georgie her mum and dad know. We just want our healthy, funny, beautiful... Mm. And it is a shocking illness. But Mari Kinsella and David Connolly have watched their daughter fade away. We are desperate that she recovers and we'll just keep fighting the battle till we find something. And it is a daily battle. We have to prepare all of Georgie's food. We're following a very tight meal plan. I got out about a week ago. Um, that admission was two weeks long. Georgie Connolly is 16 years old, but her joie de vie, joy of life, as David calls it, has been stifled by anorexia. Restricting my food kind of gives me a sense of control and relief. She started wearing baggy clothes. Yeah. And, her, you know, in hindsight, her face changed a bit, but we thought that was adolescence. Georgie had also been throwing out her lunch at school. A lot of Georgie's friends at school had been noticing that Georgie hadn't been eating. The teen had lost 10 kilos in about eight weeks. And in the first six months of Georgie's fight, therapy didn't work. David and I will remember the meeting when we said to the medical team, we were part of an outpatients program, so what else is there for Georgie? This system here, this therapy, approach isn't working and we were told by a senior medical expert that that's it. This approach in Australia is the one we've got. Desperate to get their daughter help, David and Mari packed their bags and went to the airport. Their next stop, Sweden, where they stayed for nine months. As much as I can see why my parents did it, I don't agree with what they did. She came home early and it hadn't changed her uh, mental cognitions. So she still uh, had a mental health problem, but she had behaved, she learnt to behave differently yeah, around her. She was, she was eating. She was eating, So yeah. from that point of view, it was, it was successful. 15 hospital admissions later, Georgie is stuck in a vicious, insidious cycle. I don't agree with the system that they've got going on because like I go back in there and I see like the same girls. So these acute hospitals do a fantastic job and we're forever grateful because yeah. they've kept Georgie alive. And however, they don't really address the issue when they're in hospital themselves. What happens in hospital is they'll, they'll address the, the physical side of the illness, um, so re-nourishment and, and address the, the medical stabilisation and then they're discharged. It's a bit like the, the Band-Aid on a broken leg syndrome. So, David, you have, like, a meal plan for Georgie each week? Yeah, each day we just we follow this. Um, it helps to just ensure that she's getting the food that she needs and, and also I think it uh, gives Georgie um, a feeling of comfort because she knows what she's eating. Is that right, Georgie? Does that help being able to see what you're eating each day? Yeah, if stuff's planned out a bit, it kind of stops my anxiety from just spiking. Going from hospital, which is an extremely controlled environment, to going home, which is not as controlled as you'd like, there's a massive gap. And now there's a place that aims to fill that gap. And they've got equine-assisted psychotherapy. Hoises. Hoises, yeah. <laughs> Wandi Nerida sits on 25 acres of bushland on the Sunshine Coast. It's Australia's first residential recovery facility for eating disorders. It actually is like some of the ones we've seen in parts of the US. 
Executive Director Jody Ashworth tells us the federal government pitched in $6 million, with the Butterfly Foundation at the helm of the program structure. It has 13 beds, participants staying for an average of 60 days. Our program starts at 8 o'clock in the morning and basically goes through to 8 o'clock at night. And the programs are built around three meals and three snacks a day. Meals are eaten communally. Support staff sit with participants, steering them away from old habits. If there's more anxious behaviours, obsessional behaviours, um, eating in a ritualistic way, so cutting up food into very small pieces or only eating in a certain order. But there's much more to living at Wandi Nerida than creating new food rituals. Horses are amazing animals. They can absolutely read your emotions and, and offer emotions back to you. So if, if you're anxious, horses, horses can, can feel that. Inez Caroni runs the facility's equine-assisted therapy. Just be able to interact with nature, interact with the horses um, and not have any expectations put upon them, I think is really beneficial. There's also gardening, nature walks and yoga, and a full medical team is on site, including psychiatrists, nurses and dietitians. Psychiatrist Professor Patrick McGorry. Well, we are dealing with a, a youth mental health crisis, not just in Australia, but around the world, which has been put on steroids by COVID and the pandemic. And eating disorders is one of the leading edges of this crisis. And the harsh reality is Wandi Nerida can only scratch the surface of what has become a national crisis amongst our teens. Hard to talk about, isn't it? I just wish I could make it better. <laughs> but I can't. 14 year old Hudson is battling anorexia as well, seen here in hospital for the 13th time. Yeah, that was the last admission. When Hudson goes into hospital, he is very, very upset and he generally won't speak to anyone for a good five to seven days. His mother, Christy Hansen, recalls his self-harming started in a hospital. I've had it explained to me that it's taking the pain away from what's going on inside of him, but it kills me. Some days it's like loss of control, um, like feeling like I, I can't do much. Um, then other days I just feel... Um, ..a song, it's just fun playing it. Um, like you've accomplished something. <laughs> These families share the same frustration, sick and tired of eating disorders being perceived as just extreme problems with body image or vanity. And any expert will back them right up, emphasising this is a mental illness as serious as any other. And what's needed are more dedicated treatments and more facilities like Wandi Nerida in every state. We want to focus on the early stages, the onset stage of these illnesses. And we, we, we want to make sure they don't get to the most life-threatening and severe stages without so, some attempt to intervene and, and, and support the young person and the family. Wandi Nerida is, is a first step on a very long road, a, a journey of a thousand steps. And there's this stigma about it. And this stigma doesn't help any patient that's trying to recover from this hideous illness. Who's the real Georgie? I don't know. Um, anorexia kind of gives me a identity in a way. So I'm also scared that like, oh, if I do recover, who am I and like, what am I? Unfortunately, Georgie's now back in hospital, her eighth admission this year, but she's due to be discharged on Thursday. And if you or someone you know needs help, contact Lifeline on 131114.